Welcome back fam to the Let's Talk podcast. I'm your host Winnie V and in this episode I have the honour of sitting down with a childhood friend uh, who just happens to be a first cousin of my wife Janine. I have none other than Namir Tialada who most will remember for his rugby union professional uh, career playing for the Wellington Hurricanes in the Super Rugby Comp and the Mighty All Blacks on the international stage and then he headed off to France to play in the top 14 competition. Now, while he enjoyed a great rugby career, Namir is so much more than just a rugby player. He's also a father of three and happily married, and he's also got his fingers in a few businesses, running a chemist store with his wife, Sally, a clothing and shoe brand, uh, MLX 1060, I think it is, and also a wine company, Do Chavu. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, bro. Um, so sit back, relax, uh, as I speak with Namir about his life journey, experiences and achievements on Let's Talk with Winnie V. How are you, man? Yeah, good. What an intro, man. <laughs> oh, thanks, bro. Did, did you come up with that? <laughs> I, yeah, well, I actually asked my wife, I said, oh, can you help me with an intro? She sent me something. I looked at it and I said, you know what? I'm just going to go off the fly and write, write something up real quick. Um, yeah. But welcome, bro, and thanks right. for jumping on. Um, let's start off with uh, your childhood, bro, and family, if that's okay. Um, yep. You've got an interesting family dynamic, bro. Um, is it okay if you can just share a bit about uh, your family um, and how that, um, how that, how it all started with um, your own immediate family and then moving in with um, the Soul Lele family as well? Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll dive straight in. Uh, Sorry, bro. Uh... I'm going to put you on. <laughs> no, nah, well, but. Um... Uh, got three sisters, um, and I'm obviously the only boy. Um, uh, I got two older sisters, and obviously a younger one that's obviously living there in um in Melbourne. Um, obviously our parents uh they they passed away uh when we were quite young, so um, my father passed away uh, a bit earlier, and then and then my mum a couple of years later. So then we we obviously moved in with uh, my auntie, and she's got uh, two boys and three girls, and yeah, pretty much it. So <clears throat> going from a small family to well, back then small family to a massive family um, was a was a pretty cool uh, sort of experience and transition. Um, yeah, it was tough times, I'm not going to lie about that. But um, looking back at it, um, you know, a lot of great memories. Um, obviously, uh, when, when, you've got a, when you've got a full house, um, you, you, there's always a sibling that you can sort of hassle and or pick on or get picked on, yeah. uh, picked on by and get bullied by. So, no, nah, it, was, it was quite full on. Okay, thanks for sharing that, bro. Can I ask, um, how old were you when your parents had passed on, bro? Um, so I was probably the age of seven. When my father passed off seven, eight. Man. Terrible numbers. <clears throat> and then obviously my mum died a couple of years after that. So yeah, really young. Yeah. At the time. It must have been a lot, bro, um, especially at a young age and sort of, you know, having to take all of that and, um, and then you move into um, Auntie Lopa's family, who are now your brothers and sisters all these years together. And, yeah, like you said, bro, it would have been um, a big yeah. change, small family to a big number. How, how many of you all together? Four. Oh. <laughs> Uh, how many of us? So there's me and my sisters, I'm sure. 
to you, Lee. No, 10, 10 plus my, my auntie, um, you know, I've been, we've been with her for the last, what, 25 odd years yeah. plus, um, wow. which we call her our mother. Yeah. Um, uh, well, she's she a, a special bond with her, but um, yeah. It was... oh, no, that's all good, bro. And thanks for sharing that, man. Um, now, I wanted to ask, bro, because we grew up in the same neighborhood back in New Zealand, uh, Wani Omara. And you went to Parkway College, um, but then you went to Wellington Wellington College or Wellington Boys College, which is a pretty prestigious school back home. How did that all come about, bro? How did you get from Parkway to Wainu, uh, to Wellington College? Good question. Um, where do I start? Um, pretty much was advice to leave. <laughs> In a nice way, uh, Papua College, Wainui. Um, I still remember to this day, um, my mother tried to enrol me down at uh, St. Bernard's Lower Hut and sort of got turned away from the headmaster there. And then my uncle, uh, which is my mother's uh, brother, um, he took me out to Wellington College and the rest was history. So obviously his connection with Wellington College was uh, uh, a lot of... Um, a lot of the boys' fathers that went to the school at the time, um, he knew them, so... Okay. Yeah. Nah. And it was just by chance we walked in. I still remember the day we walked in and, yeah, pretty much just asked the headmaster at the time, Roger Moses, great man. Um, yeah, he took me in with open arms. That's really yeah. cool, bro. And, um, man, Wellington College, that was, just, yeah... For, for us boys, where we grew up, man, Wellington College was like the school you dreamed of going to. Um, mm. Now, it's all sort of come full circle with you back at Wellington College, uh, part of the rugby union program there. What's that been like, bro? All those years as of been, and then going back as a coach, uh, part of the rugby team there. Yeah, it's been really good. Uh, obviously, uh, finishing up rugby professionally up in, over in France the last you know, five years ago, and sort of we moved back and... Um, I was quite adamant, like getting back into, or you know, being involved with uh, any form of of rugby, you know, footy or anything like that. So, uh, they were they were on the phone to me, you know. I still remember they were trying to call me, contact me, um, and even reaching out to close friends. Um, but I sort of turned them down, uh, only 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 because I um. But obviously, me and Sally had the year, the girls over in France quite young, and I sort of wanted to put some more time into them. Um, you know, obviously, finishing up, um, and then sort of yeah, that sort of happened. Said no to them the first year, and then the second year, sort of uh, pretty much got sick of their phone calls, and then obviously took the answer. So yeah, so I've been been part of the program for. Well, two, three years now, yeah. and that's been really good also. Um, obviously, stopped playing rugby, um, didn't really want to be involved, um, but going back there, sort of, yeah, it's, it's been a good, good process uh, in terms of um, of giving back. Yeah. And... Yeah. And you know that fire will always be burning. Um, yeah, you know, wanting yeah. <laughs> so, nah, it, it does get uh, competitive, uh, especially when you're coaching and 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 the boys aren't going too well. So, no, no, it's, it's been really good. Oh, that's really good to hear, bro. And I'm happy you're enjoying it. Um, I did want to touch on rugby now. Um, so, how did that all come about, bro? When did you first start uh, getting interest uh, with your rugby? Um, during the schoolboy days, um, who first approached you? And and something that was always interesting and something I wanted to ask um, is, so we are from Wainui. Obviously, we got a rugby club in our neighbourhood, but you ended up playing over the hill in Petoni. How did that happen, bro? How did, how did the, um, <laughs> you being in Petoni work uh, instead of yeah. playing for our hometown in Wainui? Mm, well, I really didn't play rugby up until... 
uh, college, um, like as you know, we 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 grew up in uh, rugby league over there, and uh, pretty staunch uh, rugby league um, sort of town. And <clears throat> so I start, I started off playing league when I was young. Um, come across a, a a guy with the, by the name of Pity Whippu, who's who was a good uh, friend growing up, growing up, and then obviously coming through all the uh, sort of rugby grades as well. Um, so I started off there, and then what happened was I think um, Tanu Manga, uh, he was he's he's a good local man boy. Uh, the same church as uh, as myself, so his I knew his, his family quite well. Um, he debuted for the All Blacks, and and back then I didn't even know who the All Blacks were. Um, but all I remember was was going over to Tana's uh, parents' house down the village here in Wainui, and um, we were just celebrating his obviously uh, announcement being you know being part of the All Blacks for the first time. And that was pretty much where it started from, uh, just following his his uh, his footsteps and his career. Um, and then obviously got involved with school rugby. And I think it was the age of 17 I had to decide, um, or my uncle made me decide uh, whether it was league or rugby union, so... I think he decided for me, and it's probably the best thing that ever happened. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, we come from a neighbourhood where rugby league was the dominant sport. Um, probably changed now over the years, but, yeah, we had so many uh, greats, um, whether it was a union or, or rugby league. Um, and Tunnel was um, proof of that as well. He was mm. a guy that started off in rugby league, and he most likely would have had a career in rugby league, but yeah. it changed to uh, rugby union. Um, now, going back, you had mentioned uh, you guys were from the same church, and I just wanted to yeah. ask you how much church had played throughout your law, religion in general. How much has that played in your life from, you know, as a young kid till now? Mm, uh, I was baptised in Kalana Four, which is uh, American Samoan Church. Uh, obviously, I had the privilege to, you know, my, my, obviously, my father was, um, was a minister. Um, and we were in American Samoa for, for a few years, actually studying there, and then uh, we moved back to New Zealand, and uh, we had a church out in Porirua. Um That was up until he passed away, and then that was why we moved back to Wainui. And um, it was just by chance, like the Umangas were probably one of the settlers there, and first Samoans in uh, Wainui Amada. Um and yeah, well, that's that's the connection. And to go back to your question before, um, why I ended up over the hill here in Petoni, um, I was because of Tana, that was the influence. So, um, I ended up at Wellington College. Um, coming out of there, obviously, I didn't have a, um, a rugby club because I never played uh, union when I was young, yeah. So, a lot of people expected I would go back and play for Wainui, yeah, but um, uh, yeah. A lot of my friends in that um, from Wellington uh, were, were, were joining up. The, the, the Tony Rugby Club was there, was their um, junior junior club, yeah. And they yeah, are just followed. Oh, that's all good, man. Yeah. Uh, Tony massive club. Uh, anyone who knows Wellington rugby knows that Tony are one of the premier clubs of the competition. Um, now, bro, let's get into your professional rugby union career. When did you first find? Oh, can you talk us through the day you were advised that you had made uh, the Wellington Hurricanes? What was that experience like, bro? And how did that all unfold when you were told that, "Hey, you're going to be a Hurricane, and this is when you're going to debut"? Oh, um, that was huge. Obviously, back then it was, uh, yeah, it was a big thing. Like playing for your provincial sides, uh, playing for Wellington Lions, I know that was that was a massive achievement as well. But um, finding out after that season, my first year in two thousand and three, um, that I was going to be a part of a, a you know Hurricanes, the team that sort of 
we all followed when we were young. Yeah, man. Um, and I guess half of the half of the people in Samoa, you know, are people back in Samoa and in Auckland, I guess, uh, capital of Samoa, only because there was a lot of Islanders that uh, back then that played for the Hurricanes, um, and that was a team I grew up supporting as well when sort of got into rugby, um, and so um, yeah, making it uh, it was huge. Um, I still remember. Um, you're getting that phone call from uh, Colin Cooper, who was the uh, head coach back then. And um, mm. this was before Christmas, the end of 2003. So you can imagine me, like, after coming off the uh, NPC um, season, thinking that I was going to have a good good break and enjoy Christmas <laughs> with the family. So uh, that didn't happen because, obviously, um, a week later, we had to assemble um, and go straight into camp. Uh, for Super Super Twelve back then, yeah. Um, the following year, so yeah. I, all I remember was uh, was getting that phone call. I hang up, and then my phone goes off again. And it was a uh, uh, was pity again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, just just check, checking up if I got a phone call. <laughs> that team. Yeah, yeah. So that was awesome. Um, yeah, it was, it was it was awesome, man. I, I yeah can't explain. No, that's that's great, bro. And yeah, you're right. It would have been awesome, man. You know, proud moment for yourself, all the hard work you had put in, and your family as well. Or everyone that was involved in uh, bringing you up and things like that. Uh, and yeah, it's funny uh, you mentioned pity or, or pal, um, another mm. childhood friend from our neighbourhood, uh, known to many rugby union fans out there. And he had debuted with you in the same year, or was he a year before you? Because yeah. That's- the same year, yeah, because we both went to uh, we uh, what was it we went to under twenty ones trials for New Zealand that same around that same period, so we missed out, and obviously we made the um the lines together um straight after that, and then following year we made the um, year went went and both played for the Hurricanes. Awesome man, and what was that experience like? Because bro, looking from the outside in. You were living the dream, bro, to a lot of our boys back home, you know, and, and all us boys were really proud of you guys and what you were achieving on the field. But what was that experience like, especially when you were with greats like Tana, um, and there was that period where you had um, Rodney, Jerry, and, and your flankers, um, Cullen at the back. What was that all like, bro, playing with some oh, legends? Were, were you, uh, at first, in your first year, were you um, starstruck? Were you shy yeah. around these big guys? Oh, yeah, hard. Yeah, well, yeah was... big time. So uh, that first year with the Lions, 2003, they had guys like Jonah Long with you. Yeah, yeah. But Jonah, Jonah uh, was was, just, was on the back end of his career uh, in New Zealand. Um, Christian Cullen was there. Peter Latini, Ashi Tana Umanga was there. Paul Steinmetz, all these, you know, legends that you... I remember watching them a couple of years ago on TV when I was still at college. And then walking through the the, the changing room doors and you see Christian Cullen and Jonah in the corner. You know, and then me and Pity sort of like had to find our own, you know, little corner, you know. So we actually found a spot like uh, directly opposite from those big guns. And I remember us two sitting there just watching them in awe, you know, like, fuck, man. There's Jonah Lomu right there, you know. Uh, everything you dream of, like as a kid growing up, you know, back then, man, it was it was life. Right? Was, was awesome, eh? Like well, those those were real superstars, you know. Yeah. So um, yeah, being a part of um, of that whole setup with those boys, um, man, it was good times. You can imagine as a young kid, you know, coming in, and, um, they did all the you know all the hard yards. We just we were just there just to, you know, just get signatures and photos and sending it back to our boys. Oh, man. That's... <laughs> no, it was good times. And then, obviously, the, the year after the Hurricanes, um, uh, obviously, playing most of well, all my career uh, with the Hurricanes, with the likes of, like, Jerry Collins, or the late Jerry Collins, um, Rodney Sorello there, Chris Maso, yeah, all these boys. Um, that, that was another experience. Yeah, I, I always tell these my you know the boys I'm coaching now like um, just imagine being in a pack 
and you, and all you can hear um, like during the scrum is is your back three arguing arguing over a uh, missed tackle, you know, <laughs> or assist tackles. They used to they used to uh, they used to argue between each other because one one would jump in to help assist the tackle. Um, and they, I used to remember them fighting and like arguing behind, you know, while we're packing down against, say, the Crusaders or something like that. Yeah. Yes, and uh, good times also. Oh, man, that's awesome. And I love hearing that stuff because, you know, you never really get to hear it. And whenever we all yeah. used to catch up and that, we never really talked about footy anyway. Yeah. Um, bro, can I ask, uh, during your Super Rugby career, what were some of the challenges you had faced and how did you overcome them um just in regard to injury and stuff like that bro the mental side were there any mm. um hurdles that you had to overcome bro um if you don't mind speaking on that because uh, you had quite bro, a there were lots of injuries <laughs> um bro, it's all part and parcel of uh yeah. of uh you know contact sport um yeah there are lots man and lots of uh of learnings that I could sort of think, but the, the one that sort of stands out the most was probably my early years when uh, dealing with uh, compartment syndrome. Okay. <laughs> so back then I used to, um, I don't realise that uh, that I was the only one that was suffering from uh, not being able to feel my toes. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, during warm ups, I used to go down and everyone used to think um, I'd be faking it because, yeah, I'd be tired. When, but I didn't realize that I was, I was suffering from compartment syndrome. So, compartment, compartment syndrome is, um, is obviously when the, uh, the muscle, obviously, it was, it was on my calves. So, the muscle's too big for the sheath around, around the, the actual calf. And so, the pres- process of, uh, you know the the medical process to that is that you have to obviously release some of that that pressure. So the only way to do that is obviously slicing, the cutting through the yeah, the sheath, and then releasing, and then you know let it re rebuild it and reform around the, the actual muscle. Um, so I did that, and that I sort of missed the the um, the end of two thousand and four season. And the start of two thousand and five soon, so that that took me out of um, sort of any like rep um, rugby, yeah. Um, uh, and also missed out on the Lions when they toured, yeah, the British yeah. Lions. So they they played um, they they toured New Zealand two thousand and five, I think, early. Yeah, so I missed out on all of that. So it was a tough time because obviously you go from. You go from being around the boys, yeah, um, pretty much twenty four seven. Because if you're not you're if you're not training, you're you're hanging out with you know the boys all the time. Yeah. Um. So going from from that to like being at home, um, and, and back then was when when cell phones sort of We're sort just of just hit the market. Yeah. yeah. And back then when um when the old uh it wasn't wasn't the the camera. Um, phones. Yeah. It was the uh, old Nokia. Snake... Yeah, that's <laughs> it. So you, the the only updates that you'd get was by text messages, and those text messages could only probably like only two lines. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. so keeping up with uh, what was going on at trainings was was probably uh you know one of the toughest times. Um, sort of feeling useless, helpless, being at home. Uh, not being able to be a part of all of um, all of that, and but, but mainly just um, being a part of, um, of of what's going on with the boys, you know, yeah, the band. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a, yeah. That was the only toughest, but I, I think. But later on um, in my career, um, uh, the biggest one that I sort of suffered from was um, was uh, what do you call it? I did both of my ankles at the same time, yeah. <laughs> which pretty much ended me. So, yeah, look, looking back at it, it's all part and parcel of the of the yeah. trade. But um, uh, if you've got the right support network around you, you know, of people that love and care, care, care for you, then 
uh, that's I, I think that's the most important thing that you can have as a as a professional rugby player, um, just to keep you sane. Yeah, and um, yeah. Well, that's cool, bro. Because there's a lot of, uh, and and I imagine it's even worse now with social media and all the comments that you know fans put out there on players. Mm. But it is really important to have that um, great support network, hey? Eh? Um, oh, right. it must be dark times or lonely times when when you're injured, like you said, you're at home when everyone's mm. um, getting amongst it, and yeah, um, it's a massive thing these days. Mental health, everyone's talking about it and doing more. Oh, yeah. I think, um, especially with us Polynesians, we need to talk mm. more about it because, man, you know what it's like, bro. You just keep that stuff inside, man, and just oh, yeah. carry it yourself. When there is help out there, whether it's um, family or a professional outfit, uh, but thanks for speaking on that, bro. Now, I don't. I do want to talk footy um, and eventually get to what you're doing now, um, but we'll just stay on footy for now at the moment. Um, now let's. Can I? Um, and sorry, bro. I'm just going to go back here, and this is to schoolboy rugby. Because this was a question that uh, one of the Usos, London, had asked me to ask. Um, <laughs> if you had ever played against your brother, Farsil, in First 15 rugby. Yeah. And what was what that? About it? Was that weird at home? Was, was that weird? <laughs> I should have asked this earlier, but I'll ask it now anyways. Uh, no, it was weird because um, my family were like, they were staunch Wellington College supporters. And also, you know, with St. Bernard's. But there was an, uh, there was a, um, there was one time when obviously Seal was part of the first of the theme, uh, was it 2000? I don't know. This is the and, year 2001 uh, 2000 or 99. Oh, it was 2008. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> they, they, they played against, they played us at, at Wellington College. And obviously, my whole family obviously <laughs> turned up there and, and, <laughs> Up until then, they'd been to all my games supporting me. And then, uh, obviously, that, that one day, I looked over and they were all supporting, like, St. Bernard's Day because, yeah, because they weren't, I, I look at it now, and, uh, I always think uh, it's because they weren't doing too uh, too well um, that year. So, <clears throat> no, it was funny, uh, weird, playing against your, your brother, but it was always good because uh, then they we won. <laughs> <laughs> then you get the bragging rights at home, maybe. Yeah, no, nah, but yeah. they did really well. That same team obviously uh, went on went on to doing well the following year, and yeah, I think that was the first and the last time they ever won a competition. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was a great team, and that was against Wellington Cole as well. I remember mm. um, Dre was still playing back then, but um, <laughs> anyway, yeah. we'll talk about that guy. Second, second on, year seven. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, back to rugby, bro. Super rugby yeah. in that environment, traveling to other countries such as Australia and South Africa. Can I ask, bro, within the Hurricanes, bro, who was one of the best trainers? Who was the who was, uh, the fittest guy? Who was the strongest? Uh, you can even say yourself if you were the strongest guy on, on the bench. But um, And who were some of the guys that you came across that always gave you trouble in the scrum? Uh, or just in general, one of the hardest guys on the field, whether it's a teammate or an opposition player, and what were one of the teams that you really enjoyed playing against and beating, and uh, one of the venues you loved playing at? I know it's a lot of questions mm. thrown at you, um, but yeah, um, one of the fittest blokes you've ever come across on the field, and one of the strongest guys in the gym. Mm, oh, well, the, the easiest one for that, the fittest one would have to be um, Conrad Smith. He was, uh, yeah, he was crazy, man. Like, um, I remember everyone pulling up one of um, one of the beat test um, sessions that we did, and it was a, obviously the last one still standing. And then I think we got, I'm not even kind of going to try and remember and say the level that he got to, but it was something ridiculous. Like all of us were all standing there watching, and I remember him running and he'll look over to to us boys and he'll, he'll be looking at us going, well, why am i running on my own well this is just stupid but we we're egging him on to keep going and uh obviously Con conrad um smith style he, he uh walks off that 
but he was he was one of those players just uh he was a freak uh, when it came to fitness um another one too uh surprisingly is was uh, Ronnie Soyalu. okay he used to always give him crap <laughs> he was the guy that never sweat <laughs> he's one of those guys you know yeah. all the balls would be dying and look look like he just jumped in the jumped in the pool <laughs> that guy would come in like dry ass. Yeah, no, he was pretty. He was pretty fit. Uh, who else? Oh, what was the other one? Strength. Strength. Yeah, one of the strongest guys. Um, uh, would have to be. Uh, do you remember that? Um, that hooker slash prop from uh, Waikato, <clears throat> the Malmosh. Do you remember him? Not really. Not really. Oh, yeah, he was a freak, man. But then he used to he used to throw around some some serious tin. Yeah, uh, he um. So funny story with him. He had he had similar thing to me with the compartment syndrome, but he had it in his um his forearms. Wow. Yeah. So you can imagine. So he was uh, he was a hooker, but he couldn't <laughs> throw the ball straight. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was why, because the uh, forearms were too big. <laughs> Man, that's that's crazy. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what was the other questions you had? Oh, just um, a team you like to play against in Super Rugby uh, and a venue in Super Rugby, or, or just in oh, general. Yeah, good venue. question. Um, the venue would have to be my my favorite stadium. Uh, would have to be during Super Twelve days. Would have to be um, well, obviously Caketon back then. Yeah, but that didn't count. That was the best <laughs> winners because back then was. We used to get full house. Something different, eh? Oh, right. Yeah. Glory days. Yeah. So, Caketon, if not, uh, it would have to be Pretoria. Oh, so, yeah. Yeah, where the Bulls were from. Uh, tough place to play. Um, altitude, the heat, and the crowd, too, was just, they just, yeah, can't describe it. <laughs> Passionate. Yeah. Um, <laughs> favorite team to play passion. would have to be yeah. Favorite team would have to be uh, obviously the Crusaders because they were actually the, the benchmark, you know. Yeah. And um, obviously mm-hmm. the, the All Black captain. Um, yeah. he had all the pretty boys there, Dan Carter and all them. <laughs> well, yeah, there's always been that rivalry with us in uh, <laughs> Canterbury, especially um, you know, NPC and. Yeah. yeah, those were um, yeah, good games and good rivalry. Yeah, okay. and um, yeah, both teams would always get up for it, you know. Yeah, and it didn't matter who started or you know, it was always some of the best games that you'd always watch or, or play in. So yeah, uh, hardest player that I'll come against, come up against, would have to be um, someone like Tony Woodcock. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. He was yeah. <laughs> he was good, man. He yeah, he that guy reformed uh I guess reformed, reshaped the uh, prop uh propping position. Um he wasn't big at all. He was he was tiny considering um being a proper front rower. Mm-hmm. But he was relentless, eh? Um, the amount of the understanding of um, of uh, scrummaging and his his rugby IQ as well as a prop was yeah. pro- pretty good, man. Ah, right. He was yeah. a, um, he was he was old. He was like a guy that would have fitted in the old days, eh? Like Sean Fitzpatrick days, and that yeah, just no nonsense. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say there was. You know, he, he didn't have flair, but he was just a worker, eh? He just yeah. got in those dark places that you probably yeah, get into, bro. And uh, they could mix really... it up too with the with the big boys. Like you had to keep in mind, he was by the end of his career, he was probably one of the uh, top try scorer for a front rower. Yeah, that's true. You know that? uh, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, now, bro, let's talk about your All Black career. When did you get that phone call, bro? And what did that mean to you after all the uh, success you had had early on at, at a young age? You know, you pretty much made it 
straight out of um, college. So, you know, that's a lot of success to take right after school. Um, but what was that experience like, Barry? Coming an all black and uh, a dream that every kid in New Zealand has, Barry. Um, if you uh, can just uh, give us a bit of uh, that experience. Um, yeah, it's everything you dream of, folks. Uh, you dream about it so long that it's, it, it's, you know, it's like you're expecting it, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> um, my experience that I had with Wellington College uh, sort of prepped me for, for that moment yeah, and for being in that environment. Um, not, not, not talking down where I come from, why knew, um, but all the values that I learned um, at Wellington College was, it, it prepared me for that day. Um, and like I said, it was everything that you dream of, you know, as a kid. <clears throat> but um, oh, okay. saying that, yeah. was it? No, no, no. Keep going, bro. No, so 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 in saying that, um, um, yes, I expected it, but I actually worked my ass off for it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, there were there were a lot of lonely nights where and my my siblings can, you know, they can That's speak about right. this. Yeah. Yeah, 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 they um, a lot of sacrifice went into it. Um. A lot of uh, lonely times, like I said before, dark times where where I started questioning myself if if this is all worth it, um, and and one of those things that I used to do was um, one of my weakness was 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 obviously was my fitness. <laughs> With us all Islanders, Maldives. <laughs> So I made that as a, as a strength. So I worked on that every single night. So um, you, you probably know the the route, but the route that I used to run was um, was up on the main road, and then down the strand, and then around the um, the extension, the back there. Yep. And I used to um, I used to always push myself every single night, and I'd run this every single night too. Yeah, no, I remember. If, that. if I'd if I'd miss it, if I'd miss a run. I would always make up for it the next morning, um, and it became an how do you say obsession. Yeah. Um, and like I said before, I I I'd questioned myself many times why I was doing it, but then fast forward a few years later, um, getting that phone call from um, from Darren Shandy, okay. um, you know. Mate, is everything you expect? Yeah. Um, when you put all put put all the hard work, effort, um, into something, into a goal that you sort of set out for yourself, um, I just man, you can't explain it. it was, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine, bro. And that's what I was going to ask or go back on. Um, if it was a phone call that you got getting told you were in the ABs or was it like the old days? And I think they might still be doing it now where it's all on the radio or on TV. You nah, get, it was. You find yeah, out yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. So obviously it was announced on TV before I even found out. Yeah. So I remember, um, I don't know why, but my, my whole family sort of expected me to be named in the end of year tour. So he's had a big party <laughs> ready or something like that. I wouldn't say party, but just, by accident, everyone was there. <laughs> <laughs> Those are they uh, no pressure. Oh, tell me about it. But that's that's uh, cool, man. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh by the grace of God too, you know, uh, he blessed me that night. Um um obviously name got read out. And then not long straight after that, pretty much I got a phone call um from from the manager, Darren Shan and yeah, just congratulating me. Um, and then the emails came yeah. out straight after that. And then I I think I got over something crazy, like 100 plus text messages and all these missed phone calls yeah. from everyone, just family, friends, um, just congratulating me, you know. Um, so that's funny when, when I look back at it now, because it wasn't only my dream that I was trying to fulfill, it was everyone else that was attached to me uh, that knew me. Um, that knew that um, 
if I wasn't down at the league league room playing touch, it's because I was out running the roads or um, at academy training or anything. Um, yeah. I remember you know, those days, bro. Um, yeah. I remember, you know, I'll be driving in the car and I'll see you along the road. Um, I remember one time you, you told me um, uh, all you did was you would run for 40 minutes and wherever you hit the 40 minutes, then you'll turn back and just head back home from there or something like that. And try and beat it back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just forty minutes. Just get out there and then try and get back before that. Um, and then, yeah, I remember we used to work for a furniture removals company yeah. for kids. Uh, Grace Removals. Yeah. Shout out to group. the boys. Oh uh, yeah. Shout out to uh, Norm and uh, Norm and uh, Fred, Arnold and Arjun. Yeah, all the boys. Um, all the boys. Because everyone worked there as a kid. We all worked there as a kid. Oh, yeah, holidays. Um, but I remember one time you boys had grabbed me and said, oh, we're going to the gym after work. And I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not going to the gym. And you guys held me in the van and we went to the gym. <laughs> I know um, I saw your hard work firsthand. Even Pal, you know, you'd see Pal running around or Pity around the uh, streets or back, uh, back home. Uh, <clears throat> but, man, All Blacks. That's a dream that we all have growing up as a kid back home. Mm. What was that experience like? Was that just a different level from Super Rugby in regard to um, culture and stuff like that? Oh. Uh, and what was it like um, in your first test, bro, that experience of getting your jersey, going out there, hearing the national anthem, doing the haka, and, and then playing your first game? What was that like for you? Oh, but, um Yeah, so I was lucky because we obviously toured uh, Europe, um, no, the UK, my first tour. So the first game was was, was Wales uh, and Cardiff and, wow, man, 80, I heard, was it 80,000 80, plus? That yeah. Stadium that they, and it's, uh, it's, it's um, what do you call it? It's one of those uh, stadiums with the roof, but they can also they can also open it up. Yep. So I remember at the start they're yeah, walking in, and hardly anyone was in the stadium. This is just before, maybe forty minutes before kickoff, you know. And I remember um, walking around the stadium, and I was asking uh, Ali Williams. I said, "Oh, I thought everyone was talking about how awesome the stadium is, you know, like it's always packed." And, and he was telling me. I oh, just wait till until we we come out, you know. You you want to understand? It. And so uh, I remember just the warm up in that same thing. There was hardly anyone there, and then going back inside the change rooms got changed, and all I remember after putting my boots on, um, before we came into a huddle, before we come running out the onto the grass, um, was just right, the, the people there singing, um, chanting. I remember them singing. Um, uh, Bread of Heaven, because that that was that was one of our school songs that we used to okay we used to sing, you know, up at Wellington College. So that that hit me really good. So I remember running out. There's still I think there's a photo online because someone someone tagged me onto it um, of myself running onto the pitch, and I still remember this because it had um, Joe Rockefoka was in front of me. Okay, yeah, yeah, and Rodney Soyala was behind me. And as we're running down the tunnel, because you can't see the field um, until you hit the first steps, because there's a couple of steps before you get onto the pitch. Yeah. And they, it's covered by, like, um, you know, those, uh, what do you call it? What do you call those things? It's like, uh, <laughs> like, uh, like tents, but that goes, oh, it's yeah. a long, you know, the cover. So then the, the, what do you call it? The crowds can't throw anything to the players. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But that goes all the way out towards the, the step was, you know, the first step. So when you're running out of there, you can't see or or hear much, you know. Um, so all you can see was just the, the tip of the grass. Yeah. So there's a photo of myself. I remember <laughs> going to step onto the pitch, and I I, I actually trip over myself because because <laughs> of the 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 volume and I guess everyone singing and that sort of hurt me. Yeah. And I sort of got a shock. And uh, this photo, you can see me like looking down on the grass because I've actually like tripped up and like trying to act cool. 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so I remember that. And then um the, the yeah, hearing the national anthem singing and then I can't remember after that from the haka onwards. Um it was yeah, it's still like a blur. I still can't remember. Um, because it just went just like that. Um all I remember was was playing a full game. Um I started that test uh, alongside Anton Oliver at hooker. Carl Heyman was at tight head. Yeah. And uh, Ali Williams was behind me. And obviously Jerry Rodney and um and Chris Marsui was playing the ball. So now nah, it was, it was, it was yeah, it would have. Yeah, bro. It would have. Uh, just awesome, man. Just awesome. What um, was the other question you said, sorry? Oh, bro. Um, oh, sorry. in general, that's all good. In general, bro, mm. what's it like performing the haka um, in front of the opposition, bro? Because I, were you part of the team that did the haka in the sheds one year? When yeah, yeah, yeah. That was us, 2006. Yeah, it was. Yeah, so um, what happened there was the the Welsh decided to make us do the haka, perform the haka before the anthem. Yeah, yeah it doesn't work that way. Yeah, yeah. So they try to make it about, you know, about them and, and around that. So we decided, look, haka is not for anyone else. It's for us as players. So the leadership group decided, um, you know, it was best to just to perform it in the in the tra- changing rooms with um, with the rest of the boys, uh, which and all I remember was you could hear the the crowd booing, eh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, but that was out out out, out of um, our control. What we did was was did what was best for us and what was best for the jerseys as well. So yeah, but performing it, um, you know, it's like we was growing up in New Zealand. <laughs> That's the first thing you sort of learn, eh? <laughs> yeah. Growing up is, is, is uh, how to haka. Even though it's uh, not the right words or the right actions, you, you still go with it. But, um, yeah, man, special, special times. Now, Nays, um, you had a great career, bro. Um, at the end of the All Blacks career and, and your rugby in general in New Zealand, was it hard when you were told that you... Your services were no longer required in the black jersey, and was it hard when you had to make that decision to move on from New Zealand rugby? Um, oh, of course, bro. Yeah. You know, something that you work hard for all your life, um, that you dream of when you're young. Um, to be told that you know that's you know we've got someone else better here to do the job, <clears throat> but um, in saying that, I, I was quite lucky that uh, my Sally. Um, with me at the time there when the announcement happened and um, I just remember us taking a, a, we took our time going up to Auckland because we it was in Hamilton when um, when they announced that and instead of going on the team bus uh, I decided to go, go with her yeah uh, so then I could avoid the media yeah you can. so I actually snuck out through the back door uh, the hotel and uh, made our way up to Auckland and then um, we chilled out there for a couple of days I think or a day and then um, yeah we came back home back to Wellington it was all yeah got together with uh, family and that and that was awesome um, having that support there but um, yeah it is tough times it was tough times but um, as, as a professional rugby player you know your time is limited, so true that. Um, yeah, just like with anything, um, I guess in this world that we live in, you know, you never know when your time is up. Yeah, um, and that's that's my attitude with it, with everything. So that's why I I sort of uh, never take anything for granted. Um, I will try and do the right thing most of the time, <laughs> but as you do, you learn and um, and you move on. So yeah, it was, it was a bit like that. Um, it was hard, but yeah, it's all part of life. No, nah, no, nah, that's all good, bro. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so you moved to France, bro. You ended up playing rugby there for a few years. What was that like, bro? What was the was it a massive culture shock moving to France? And was it 
Good, and this is something that would have been happening during your time as an All Black. The players, a lot of them, you, you started seeing a lot more brown faces in the All Blacks um, during those years that you're going uh, coming up through the game. Yeah, but uh, in France, was it um, was it good knowing that there were a lot of Polynesians also making the move over to the UK and France and playing their their rugby over there? What was that like, bro? Playing in France and the different culture and and having to learn a new language as well to to get by you know, while you're there. Oh, man, massive uh, culture shock, especially uh, when you come from Wanyamara, where you know, there's only a few hundreds there living there. <laughs> to go into a country, there's, uh, oh, I don't know, so many people. Um, obviously, they they have their own way of um, of life over there, and then. And and how they do things and how they get by, but in saying that, oh, I'm quite open minded to everything, um, to anything really. And my my sort of mentality going over there was was obviously uh, yeah to play footy, but at the same time, it was a great opportunity to to see the other side of the world. Yeah, um, yeah. obviously you do a lot of that with the with the All Blacks and and other teams that you play with. Um, uh, super super twelve, but um, to go over there, experience living and you know playing rugby there, it's it was an awesome opportunity. Um, looking back at it now, it's uh, we've me and my um, Sally actually had our our two little girls over there. Yeah, um, we we got stuck into it into into the culture. Um, and just everything about the the French life was it sort of they sort of live like uh, islanders in yeah. some some respects um like family's really important to them over there that's cool. so yeah yeah so um what do you call it you know with us islanders Sunday's always the day where everything is is on hold, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Everyone goes to church, um, yeah. and then you come home, have your big big feeds, and then you go to sleep. Yeah, it's pretty much the same over in France. Like um, nothing's open on Sundays. Okay. Um, yeah, families and they get together at lunchtime, and and they carry on until until late in the um, in the evening. Um, that's something that we couldn't get used to at first, um, only because um, shops and that weren't open. Yeah. Um, just different things like that, little things that, that that's huge, you know. You go from New Zealand um, and being able to do a lot of things in one day. Yeah. Get over there and it, you can only do this. I'm speaking to the, the people that, that, that's been over there experiencing it, experienced the, um, the way of life over there. As you get over there and, and you can only do one thing at a time. Uh -huh. And if it's going down to the post office, then that's all you do for the whole day. Yeah, when I what I mean by that is they, yeah, they're pretty uh, they're pretty ruthless over in France. Say eh? they um, a lot of places um don't operate with with computers. They're oh, still yeah. old school writing things down. Jeez. Um, yeah, so it was a massive culture shock for us too that we had to sort of get used to and and pretty much dive into and. And, and enjoy and which we did me and Sal did um Tushi uh living down in the on the south there uh the border of you know Spain was just like a 15 minute drive from where we lived and then that was in Beiritz Bayon and then we moved to Toulouse um they're, they're crazy there with, with the rugby they love their rugby there it's a, it's a rugby town and and it's a wonderful uh, um what do you call it? Fan base there, yeah. Um, and also the the, the um the history at the club there, Stade Toulouse, and and just the success they have over there at that club. Um, yeah, also it's pretty cool. Yeah, oh, I would say it would be cool, man. The south of France, beautiful area. You see it on TV and stuff, and you go, man, would love to go over there for a holiday. Uh, but yeah. living there, uh, and then there's yeah. the food and um, the culture around food and and wine. 
um, things like that. So that would have been awesome, bro, and uh, a good experience. Um, and, and now today, in today's rugby game, you see a lot of players that they just skip uh, the New Zealand uh, Southern Hemisphere uh, professional rugby scene and go and apply their trade overseas and make a good, you know, a fairly decent career out of it. Yeah. So there's yeah, there's a few boys from back home that have done that. Um, but let's touch back there. You had mentioned uh, you and Sally, your wife. You had uh, your two girls over there in front. You you had yep. a family over there. Now, family, bro. Um, I just wanted to ask, well, um, how's that experience, bro, been for your parenthood? And you've recently had a son. Um, what's the uh, experience you've had as a father, and how did that change everything you do? Because obviously, you would have been living the life, bro, for a lot of years as a professional player here in New Zealand. Um, and then in France, you know, started off with you and your wife and you would have been able to, you know, go and do things that couples do with no kids. But what was that like, bro, when you first had your daughter um, and, and everything changing around you? Um, just even your mindset, bro. Um, was yeah. it, were you straight into that? That's it, man. I, everything I do now is for, for my babies. Um, yeah. That was the mindset going forward. Um, if, if you don't mind talking about parenthood, bro, and how that shaped you and changed uh, your life since you've become a father? Oh, massively, was, as you would know. Um, obviously, uh, I had my kids quite late. Um, in terms of uh, the friends that I have around me, they all had their kids uh, yeah, quite right. young, yeah. quite early, should I say. Um, yeah, we had, we had our kids quite late. But in saying that, um, we got to tick off everything that we wanted to do. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, got to experience the, the, you know, France and the world over there and, and being able to travel. Um, and then when we decided, yeah, it was time to sort of, you know, put some kids in the, in the, mix. <laughs> in the picture, in the mix. Um, yeah, that, that, yeah, everything changed. Um, but like you said, the mindset changed. Um, you weren't playing just for yourself or um, your partners and stuff like that. You you tend to it gives you another list of uh, I guess another reason to get up even more yeah. um, to go to trainings. You know those days where you feel like you're sick and can't make it out of bed to go train. Um, you know that that sort of puts things in perspective and keeps you sort of grounded in some ways. Um, so having Sadie over there in Biarritz or Bayonne, um, it was awesome. Uh, we, yeah, obviously being over there, don't have much uh, family members over there. Yeah, didn't sure. have much help. Um, just make do with the friends that you, you make, with the teams that you play for over there. Uh, we were quite lucky. Um, Sally's parents... Um, would visit quite often yeah. and they would stay extendedly like over like one month will turn into two months, two <laughs> months into three. <laughs> yeah, it was good. Um, that, was, that sort of took the pressure off me as well. Um, having to train, play and, and be there for, for, for our kids. And then, uh, yeah, we moved to Toulouse and we had uh, Taylor, who's our youngest. Oh, well, she's the second one now. The middle, the middle kid. Um and yeah, like you said, just recently we had um we just had our first boy, Jack James. Um yeah, he's he's awesome, man. It's, cool, it's man. a different story when you when you when you have two girls and then you get a boy. <laughs> yeah, you're lucky, man. You're like, oh man, I'm still asking the wife, should we you know, give it a go? And she's like, No, nah, no, nah, we're done. We're done. Yeah. Um, but that's awesome, bro. I'm I'm happy to hear that you know, uh, the kids are doing well, and I have no doubt you're a good father, bro. I, I know you're a good. Father, <laughs> I try, you know? I try. Was ah, that, hey, we all try. Um, <laughs> but that's cool to hear. You know, the mindset changes because it would have been you. You would have played with a lot of guys during your um, days as you know, no kids. Mm. Whereas uh, the guys with the kids, things would have been different around maybe the. Drinking party culture, oh, for sure. party, you know, oh, these guys aren't going to join, or 
Oh, sure. Not that I did any of that stuff, but yeah. <laughs> but um, no, that's cool, bro. And um, so you have the family over there, and you also, um, that's where, well, you have, let, let's get into the business side of things and what you're doing now. So um, you have a wine company, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, bro. Dosha Vu or Dosha Vu. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll let you pronounce it, bro. What's the wine business called? <laughs> De Chavaux. Oh, okay, okay. And what does that exactly mean? Is that two horses or something? Yeah, two horses in French. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, obviously, France, you know, world-renowned for their wines. How did that all come about, bro, getting into the wine business while you're in France? Oh, well, <laughs> where do I start? Um <clears throat> Yeah, well, as my mother knows that, I, I don't drink. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I hope she's not watching this. <laughs> no, she doesn't watch this. Um, I met, uh, oh, well, yeah, part of the French life is is, is around, around family, culture and all that. So they do a lot of sitting down and, and eating and drinking. And so wine is, is is massive over there. Of um, whether it's it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, yeah, um, that's just that's what they do. Um, it's part of their life, it's part of their upbringing, and it's um, there's a lot of qualities that come out of uh, sitting around. It works, you know, around yeah, a yeah, bottle of red. Yeah, yeah, a lot of good discussions. Um, a lot of good business uh, decisions are made around uh, a bottle of wine. But um, no, I actually, um, towards the end of my career over there, I, you know, I, I was injured and recovering from uh, ankle surgery. And I met a, f- a French French guy over there. Actually, uh, he was a footy player as well. And... Um, what do you call it? Ended up being uh, one of my best mates. Okay. Um, uh, Cam- Camille uh, Blanc is his name. And I actually met him at this uh, rehab place. Not alcohol rehab, but sports <laughs> rehab. <laughs> um, so he was he was, he was was in the room across from me in, in, at this place. And, and I played the old island card and pretended I didn't speak uh, French. Um, and then, and then he was the only guy that could speak English, so he would try and speak English to me, you know, yeah. broken English. And but I understood everything he was saying because my French isn't isn't that bad, you know. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so I actually got to know him quite well there. And then, uh, funny enough, he only lived a couple of villages down from where we all staying, okay, um, in Narbonne, and he yeah, got got to bond with him pretty closely and met his family, went up there and, you know, did the full, um, what do you call it, uh, harvesting and all that. Uh, his family owns a vineyard, obviously up in uh, uh, Vinistos, up in uh, Narbonne there. And um, oh, I remember one of our sessions that we had, or lunch, lunch sessions, uh sitting down and, and drinking the family wine and all that. I said to him and his, his father, um, that would be an, be an awesome idea to um, create our own wine here and, and, and bring it back to New Zealand, you know? Yeah. And they laughed at me thinking um, thinking that, you know, yeah, whatever, you don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, so that's pretty much how it started. Yeah, so yeah. I moved back to New Zealand obviously when I finished up and Got Kimmy over here to to come and have a look at how um, how how it's all set up here in Masterton and took him down Nelson, took him to a few uh, vineyards, tasted a lot of wine around here, and then we decided to bring um, uh, Rose because Rose is massive um, in that area where he, he is from, okay. and that's what we drank over there too for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> And um, yeah, that's where we started off. Okay, that's cool, bro. And how's how's the business going now, bro? Because I see <laughs> that um, you ventured with the two wines, the red and uh, white wine, but you've also got um, 
I don't know what you would call them. I'd call them lolly drinks. Uh, <laughs> your your new product. How how's the business going now at the moment? <laughs> to be honest, it's uh, it's on hold. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, COVID wasn't wasn't good for our business. Um, we had a shipment that um that was brought over here, got fermented, was fermented in the out at sea. It, obviously, when they opened up the containers exploded oh. so we wasted half a year on, on, on that half a year's work on that um, we've got another container of uh, wine that's sitting here at the moment I'm just waiting for um, just going through the process of getting all the paperwork um, loaded up onto the uh, portal uh, with food stuff New Zealand so we are in the process of trying to get it into um Supermarket. Supermarkets here in New Zealand. So that that's actually ready to go pretty much. So all the hard work, the groundwork, um leading up to that is you know, was 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 good. Yeah. Um and it's at a stage now where I can actually get it out there yeah. to, to a bigger audience. Yeah. That's massive, bro. Um if you get it into the supermarkets, uh even the bottle stores around the country. That's that's big, bro. Um, so, well, yeah. uh, it sounds like uh, things are gonna start happening. Uh, yeah. Wine. Um, now, another business of yours, bro, is you run a chemist, or your wife runs a chemist um, out there in Wellington. Mm. How did that all come about, bro? Because I do not take you. Uh, well, obviously, you would have been on <laughs> a lot of meds and uh, had a lot of surgeries during your footy career. But how did you get mixed up in the chemist game, bro? Uh, I call it a le- legit drug dealer. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, nah, well, Sally's a um, a qualified uh, pharmacist. So when we um, when we left for France, um, she completed that obviously, and then we knew um, that was all part of our plan. Was uh, <laughs> she go over there and live the luxury life and enjoy it while I was uh, still playing, um, keeping in mind that. Um, our plan was always to come back and buy a pharmacy. So that's pretty much what we did. We moved back to New Zealand uh, four or five years ago. We bought a pharmacy out of Brooklyn um, in Wellington. Um, and now we're, we're looking at, uh, well, hopefully, if it all goes well, um, to our second one. Oh, awesome, man. Yeah, so I, well, I'm not the pharmacist she is. So obviously during COVID and that, so I was doing the, the rounds with dropping off the meds to the old people. So I did get pulled up a few times from the police. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can imagine that conversation. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. so it's quite that, funny. It's really cool to hear that that's going really well, bro. And that's something that uh, what makes it even cooler is that you're doing it with your wife or your wife's doing it and you're, like you said, you're the delivery boy. Um, but that's awesome, bro, and that's really cool because it's a hard thing, I'm guessing, um, for a lot of players, when they retire, what are they going to do? You know, mm. um, do, do professional, uh, obviously you're getting, um, you're getting contacted throughout your career of different business ventures and what to pick and choose and decide outside of footy when the footy's over. Mm. Uh, was that ever hard for you or was that something you had already um, drawn up as a plan with your wife? Like you said, the plan mm. was always to come back to New Zealand, but did you have those plans ready to go or did you know what you were going to do in regard to life after footy? Yeah. Yeah, we did actually. Um, as you do when you're playing rugby, uh, professional rugby, you sort of, uh, you find all the excuses to say I'm too busy to do anything else. Um, but that's just an excuse, man. I find I look back at it now. The times that I did have uh, where I could have uh, used, you know, in, in a better way to to study or to work, yeah. Um, there was a lot of times and a lot of op- um opportunities to to do that, but obviously yeah, didn't capitalize on it. Um, but these hey, these yeah. boys nowadays they they um they're well supported with that sort of stuff. Um, if not, then they should be looking or like reaching out to guys like myself that's been there, done it for a long time. Yeah. Um, but in terms of a plan in there, I did actually, um, well, I did try and study. 
yeah. <laughs> a, um, in a degree of uh, visual arts that I only managed to finish two years. And then obviously the third year I had to pull out because I was, I was full-time, you know, playing footy, so I couldn't be there. Um, so I knew that playing rugby, I knew that at some stage I was going to go back and finish that degree. And then, <laughs> obviously that didn't happen. Uh, made that, the All Blacks, and then even got got more busier, you know, like yeah. it was quite full on. So then when Sally came in the picture, we, uh, yeah, we, Drew up what, what our plan was going to be like, um, you know, after rugby. Um, yeah, what 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 kind of age we're looking at? Because then that's where our kids and that sort of came in the picture. Um, uh, we did actually talk about it, you know, numerous of times, like how we were going to plan um, for the future and what that would look like. Um, so knowing that um, that Sal had a degree, um, you know, with with, with chemists, with pharmacy, and that. I knew that that we we had time to fall back on in terms of um, taking the pressure load off me uh, when when rugby was finished or if it was taken away all of a sudden, you know. Yeah. Um, but that didn't stop me, um, you know, with the drive that I had, um, not to just label myself as a rugby player. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think when I look back at it now, that's where I get my drive to get up and. And get myself into all these these adventures. <laughs> no, that's all good, bro. Because <laughs> yeah. um, then that, that flows on to what I was going to say next is that um, a lot of people laugh at me because you know I don't have a degree, I don't have any diplomas, but I do have a um, a master's in um, in YouTube. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a master's too, bro. <laughs> um. um no, but yeah, you, you try your best to 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 plan and all that, but obviously, um, a lot of lot of times it doesn't doesn't go pan out the way that you you want it to. Yeah. So you all you, you obviously got to have a plan A, B, C, or you know. Um, and I I don't like to limit myself too, which is, um, in a good way. It's a good trait. In a bad way, it, it's not that good. Yeah. Um, because I do like to keep myself involved with a lot of things. Um, I'm just that type of person. I, I hate sitting around um, dwelling on something that that I can't could be in control with. Yeah. Mm. So after rugby, um, yeah, we came back, bought the pharmacy. Uh, I said to sell, look, I've got to give me two years of just trying to figure out uh, what I want to do next. So those two years I thought I'd go back and study, which was perfect time and another example, you know. Yeah. Uh, but then I had, I had that COVID hit, obviously, and then I obviously had different other ideas of what my um, career would look like. Yeah. Um, and that's where I'm at now. I've got the wine business with Kimi. Um, I've started my own sneaker yeah. uh, brand uh, with MLX 1060. So 1060 is my all black number. Okay. So that's where, okay. So just, that's my brand. Yeah, that's where it yeah. comes from. Okay. Uh, that's cool. And I've also, uh, two weeks ago, with a good friend of mine, uh, Joe Joseph Olive, yep. we just bought uh, another business. Okay. Um, Icon Sports. So Sports oh. Apparel. It's a cricket brand, but um, yeah, they look after a lot of a lot of other sports. Um, so we've got ourselves into that. That's cool. And yeah, so we're pretty busy. Also. Yeah, no, that's cool. Um, I was going to touch on the clothing uh, brand there, um, but that's cool. You know, a little exclusive there. You and Joel Lever, another guy who's um, doing what a lot doing? of stuff. From, yeah, a guy from mm. uh, our neighbourhood, childhood friend. Doing a lot of good stuff out in the community and, and doing his own business. Uh, I believe he's uh, started in the electrical uh, field. Um, yeah. Uh, his his uh, little business there. But he's doing great things. Actually, he's another guest that's going to be on the podcast. We're oh, just going awesome. to sort out um, dates <laughs> times. Um, but MLX, 
1060. So that clothing shoe brand is named after, or the inspiration behind the name is from your all black number. Yeah. Now, what have been the challenges with the clothing and shoe uh, brand, bro? Because there is, and even I thought about it at one time, like, like you said, you hate being um, busy, uh, sitting down and, and doing nothing. And that was me for, that's where I got my YouTube master. Um, just watching <laughs> YouTube on how to start a yeah. brand, how to start a podcast. And I was sitting on this for a good two years. And it wasn't until I think um, either my birthday or Christmas and um, my sister-in-law or your cousin, Nikki, she wouldn't got me a podcast mic and she goes, Oh bro, oh, no. I got no excuse now. Uh, I said, yeah. Okay, well let's let's do it. Um so yeah, Nikki in London, they they really kicked it off because I probably <laughs> spent another year just mulling around watching YouTube how to videos. Yeah. Um but what, and now with clothing, it seems like um it's like podcasting. It's like every second person has a clothing brand or a podcast show now. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, bro, what was the inspiration behind the clothing and shoe brand? What have been some of the challenges and what's the future looking like for your uh, clothing and shoe brand? Yeah, so I've always been, um, uh, what do you call it? I've always been into my drawing, designing, all of that stuff from my background. Um, Especially, you know, during my career as well. I was doing a lot of that stuff, um, you know, just in my free 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 time and and space as well. So, um, yeah, during that those two years, uh, I decided actually I've always loved sneakers. I had a passion for sneakers. You know, yeah. I've got yeah. a uh, sneaker collection there. That um, I, I I sort of did a uh, thing for a friend of mine over in France. That's on YouTube. Um, yeah. The sh- yeah, I was showing my sh- the shoes shoe collection that I had, but what people didn't realize the shoes that I actually showed on that on his on his uh, program was um was shoes that I was wearing like every day. So that wasn't including any of my other shoes that I had oh, in another room. Right. That was all the boxes. I didn't want to be that guy. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, what you had already shown on that YouTube video, and I'll probably put a link on all <laughs> that YouTube video. But man, that was a collection. Like. Nah. <laughs> So all of those shoes, I, I gave it away to like the young kids that I played with over in France. Um, but I, yeah, on the other hand, I had another whole room of like shoes that were in boxes. Yeah, and still to this day, so uh, that was my thing uh, was shoes. So anyone that knows me well, yeah, always love my shoes. Um, so that's where the oh. yeah, well, that's where the inspiration came from. Um, doing creating my own that was always my thing that I wanted to do. Yeah, was 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 one day I was gonna make my own shoe, design my own shoe, and make it and sell it or like give it out or whatever. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the business adventures that I wanted to get myself into. Um, at the time, we just bought a uh, the pharmacy, so Sally was like, There's no way in hell. You're using any of our, our money to invest into that, <laughs> <laughs> that you can come up with that. So I said to me, okay, I've got an idea. Because um, during that time, all oh, everyone was getting into these basketball shorts hey, yeah. a couple of years ago. Yeah, so, do it the best at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the idea. I, I yeah. did these shorts also, and that was the reason why I did clothing, was to make, make some money. Um, to fund my yeah my new sure. project that I wanted to do, yeah. so that was what I pretty much did, and uh, made a bit of money with the shorts, and invested them straight into the this first collection that I did, um, that I launched the end of last year. Um, so I'm still it's funny because I'm still learning all of because all of the stuff is all f- new to me. Um, like I said before, I never went to school for it, design school or anything like that but I learned everything from the process of making um, you know design point to like a, a tech pack to you know finding a manufacturer to speaking to finding the right one and then speaking to the right people finding out what the market is like you know all of that stuff uh, I'm not even going to pretend that I know it all but oh, that's that, all good you're learning I, I, 
yeah, something sort of hap- uh, worked out for me. And so I'm in the process of now um, selling them online. So uh, I've already sold, you know, quite a bit. And, and if, you know, what the future would look like with that is I'm planning to I'll come out with another, um, what do you call it, another line that will obviously future, uh, you know, some more new kicks or new, new sneakers that I'm, that I've got, uh, you know, for for the future. Um, but that's like a thing that I've, I, I really, I was really creating that not only for myself, but um, it makes sense now because my son's here. Yeah, yeah. I was really was was anticipating having a boy, and it's all worked out. Um, That's funny. Setting him up with a brand that uh, that means something to not in myself, but my 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 father, um, who was to um, that's that's the reason why, and the MLX actually is actually Roman numerals for to one thousand sixty, and my father studied um, Latin, you know, with the with the um, ministry uh, college over in Granifo in American Samoa, so all of that stuff uh, all sort of sort of re- related and intertwined. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's awesome, bro. That's a great story. Um, things happen for a reason, you know. If, oh, awesome. Um, you know, God is good, man. God is good. Yeah, yeah. God is good, man. And a lot of us Polynesians, we it's pretty much the same upbringing church and and mm. god and, and jesus and things of that nature but god really does work in mysterious ways bro and oh hell yeah uh, yeah just even the name of how um that all came together that, that's an example um but that's awesome bro it's awesome to hear that things uh, are going well in general in life you know you're coaching a footy team you and your family your businesses so i'm really proud and, and happy to hear that everything's going uh, really good for you at the moment bro uh, now just to uh finish it off bro what's your what's your piece of advice to those that are tr- well here, here, here's it um here, here's the question for the young ones that are coming up in rugby or any kind of sport what's the advice that you give to them um, and what's the advice to those that are trying to um, get into business, whatever type of business it is, or just sitting on the sidelines and not chasing mm. their dreams and, you know, not too scared to get out into the spotlight and, and put their hand up and, and go after, you know, their, their goals and stuff like that. What's, what's your advice for those out there or the listeners that may be listening to the podcast? Well, what's the advice, bro? Good one. Um, I'm not even going to try and advise anyone. Okay, okay. but I, I think I think um, if this was a message to myself, uh, a younger Nimitialara, age of seventeen, uh, it would probably look something like this. Um, um, what is it? I'm trying to find the words here. Oh, sorry. Um, but um, believe in yourself. Um, I know that sounds cliche, but we are all built differently. Um, but we are all given the same opportunities as well. Doesn't matter what sort of situation God puts you in. Uh, we all go through adversity, but it's um, the individual. That's what it comes down to. Um, life is, is is supposed to be hard, yeah. but life also um, uh, is meant to to enjoy and and to learn from your mistakes. Yeah. So don't be afraid of it. Uh, don't be scared of it. Um, embrace it, and actually um, take an action. Like back yourself, take an action, and just believe in, believe in yourself. And, and I, I'm just speaking like, um, not only to the younger me, but just in general, like, yeah, because yeah. us Islanders, we are built, brought up like that. We are, yeah. 
It's um, um to respect, uh, and it's beautiful. Our culture is beautiful. Yeah. Um, but at times too, it can hold us back from um, so true, bro. From 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 reaching reaching the stars. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's. Um, uh, that's but I tell you what, man. Uh, if I can do it, um, if Tana could do it, who was someone that I I looked up to. Um, if my mother or my auntie could do uh, become a mother of uh, ten kids, yeah, uh, all under the age of seventeen, I think at the time, living in a three bedroom house um, with a bit of sacrifice, um, that goes a long way. Uh, nah, I love that, bro. Yeah, it's so. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to help or. Oh no, that's a great message, think, man. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a message. That's how I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up. Yeah. Um, not, I'm not going to advise anyone because I'm not in that. That's not me. That's not me. But I'll share what I have, and have done. Um, and I'm forever grateful. Uh, the good Lord have blessed me with a, with a beautiful mother that cared for us. Um blessed with a beautiful wife uh, who loves me and and my kids unconditionally. I've got beautiful kids that are, um, they just has given me another sense of uh, of waking up and, yeah. and, 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 and and going after it and chasing uh, um, whatever it is. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much it also. Oh, that's awesome, bro. So there you have it, ladies and gents, uh, from the man himself, Namir Tealada. Now back yourself. Get out there and just, you know, you would never. And and trust me, I've been in that position, man, where I'm just like, nah. And, and even at times now, I still doubt myself, even with this podcast. But oh, God. Um, back yourself, you, you really don't know until you give it a go. Uh, yeah, was, you're doing to say to you, you're doing an awesome job, Wolves. Oh, thanks. Man. I actually, I actually listened to uh, your first one with uh, with Kong over here, with also, and uh, <clears throat> it was interesting to to listen to. And and I must admit, man, hats off, but hats off to you oh, uh, and you, what you're doing, Wolves. Um, you need to keep up with it. Yeah, I need to. Yeah, be consistent. And, uh, yeah, man. I like whatever this may lead to, man. Yeah. Now that you know, you can do it. You do anything okay. else that you really put your mind to and really want. Well, thank you, my bro. Um, that's us uh, from me and, and I on uh, Let's Talk with Winnie V. Thanks for listening if you're still here. Uh, but, bro, all the best uh, for your future endeavours with business. All the best with the kids, bro. Uh, can't wait to see more updates of your son. Uh, and those will be some great milestones when they come round. First pair of footy boots and first uh, <laughs> game on a cold, uh, wet, Wellington morning. Um, but, Barry, all the best to you and the family and, and to um, Auntie and, and the rest of the siblings back home. Thank you so much for your time, Barry. It's been uh, an honour. It's been a pleasure. Uh, but that's us here at uh, Let's Talk Winnie V. And uh, everyone stay safe out there.